Hello, chemistry students. If you're watching this video, it means you've already watched the other videos provided for you on electron configurations. Those videos were excellent. They're, they're way better than what I could have done. That's part of the reason why I referred you to those electron configuration videos. This particular video, it's focused on some of the electron configurations that aren't so simple. So it's really focusing on irregular electron configurations and electron configurations for transition metals and their cations. So I'm gonna start with the irregular electron configurations. Again, if you have, none, have not watched the basic electron configurations, go back and watch those first. So with irregular electron configurations, you have to know that there's sublevel splitting and the 4S sublevel, even though it's the valence shell, is slightly lower in energy than the 3D. And that's because, again, the S electrons, so the electrons in S orbitals have better penetration. So as a result, because of their better penetration, they're at a lower energy level because they're closer to the nucleus. So again, even though the 4S sublevel is considered the valence shell because the principal quantum number is four and four is bigger than three, it is slightly lower because of the sublevel splitting than the 3D sublevel. So the 4S fills before the 3D, and you see that in your periodic tables. But the difference in energy is not that large, and as a result, you know, we get some irregular patterns, and we'll also notice what happens when we discuss the transition metals cations as well. So some of the transition metals have an electron configuration that you can't really predict based on the elemental symbol and which block or energy level they're located on. And that typically happens between the S and the D. So like the 4S and the 3D or the 5S and the uh, 4D. It even happens with uh, the 6S and the 5D. So their electron configurations are basically found experimentally. So the reason why I'm going over this is the, if you ever take an ACS exam from the American Chemical Society, a lot of schools or colleges, they use that as a final. Uh, if you look in your book, the homework problems, they love these problems. So I'm gonna go over the ones that are the most common. So first, these are examples of really common ones that you're gonna see on a problem. You know, I might even put this on one of my tests. So if you look at chromium, right? It's in the uh, D block. It's in uh, the 3D sublevel, and it's in the fourth position. So you would think it's a 4S2, 3D4. Just like copper, you would think it's a 4S2, 3D9 if you're looking at a periodic table. And molybdenum, 5S2, 4D4. But it's actually found experimentally that chromium's a 4S1, 3D5. Copper is a 4S1, 3D10, and molybdenum is a 5S1, 4D5. So what's happening? So when we look at the particular group of six and the group of 11, we're actually noticing that the S sublevel, instead of being completely filled, is half filled in these irregular configurations. So the next slide is going to explain why is the S sublevel half filled. And we also start noticing that the D sublevels, instead of almost being half filled or all the way filled, they end up becoming all the way filled, or I'm sorry, halfway filled or all the way filled. So the first thing I want to tell you is when you're thinking about sublevels, okay? And this is why I love the orbital diagram above electron configurations. Electron configurations are just good at kind of keeping track where the electrons are, but the orbital diagrams kind of tell us about a lot of the irregular patterns that we see with configurations and periodic trends. So sublevels, first, they like to be filled. Second, if they're not filled, they like to be halfway filled. Third, if they're not Halfway filled, they like to be empty. So when you're looking at sublevels 
and the orbitals within the sublevels think. The orbitals like to be filled, they like to be halfway filled, or they like to be empty. So let's take a look at chromium's orbital diagram. We, we would think because it's in the, you know, group six or the D4 position in the periodic table, that it would be a 4s2, 3d4. So when I write out that electron configuration and use the orbital diagram to represent it, so the 4s2 would be spin up, spin down, and then the 3d4 would be one, two, three, four. Now, what we notice is this 4s sublevel is happy because it's filled. This 3d isn't, right? It's not filled, it's not halfway filled, it's not the way all the way empty. So what you can think about it, because these are so close in energy, what actually happens is that anti-parallel S sublevel electron is placed in that 3D sublevel so that it can at least have one of these. And what we see experimentally, that's what actually happens. We actually have a 4S1 and a 3T5. Now, why is it happy? Because the 4S sublevel, it's not filled like it was here, but it's halfway filled. And the 3D, which had nothing, is now halfway filled. So that's how I like to kind of explain it to students. So let's look at copper, right? You would think based on its position, right? Group 11, that it would be 4s2, 3d9. So you would go one, two, because we're following Hun's rule, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight, nine. So again, the 4s is happy. Why? It's filled. The D is not happy. Why? It's not filled, it's not halfway filled, and it's not empty. But it's so close to being filled. So this electron, this end, actually does what? Fills it up. So we get a 4s1 and a 3d10. And now when you look at it, the d is stoked. <laughs> it's filled. And the 4s sublevel is pretty happy because it's halfway filled. So it's a good compromise. Now, when you go to molybdenum, we just go to 5s and 40, same concept as chromium, right? You would think you'd want to be 5s to 4d4, but it's not. Why? It's a 5s1, 4d5. Why? Everything's halfway filled. So I try to use the orbital diagrams to explain this irregular electron configuration to help us think about that. So now what about the weirdness with electron configurations of transition metals when they form cations? So when you're forming cations, you're losing electrons, okay? So with transmission metals, we have to realize we're actually gonna remove the electrons from the valence shell the valence shell being the outermost energy level, or you can think about it as the principal quantum number that is the largest. So four would be bigger than three. So even though you filled those 4s electrons first, you remove those when you form your cations. So what am I talking about? Okay, so well, let's take a look. So we know that iron, if we look at iron, Basically, it's a 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. How do I know that? Well, look at the periodic table. Where is it located? Well, it's located, right? We know that this is my 4s, and then there's 3d. This is in the d block, right? This is the first, second, right? First, second, third. Fourth, remember that's where your chromium and molybdenum are. Fifth, it's in that sixth position. So that's why it's a 3D6. Now, 
I think it's beneficial when you're figuring out the transition metal cations is to first write out the atom. That'll help you out big time. But now, what can iron form? Well, it's a metal, it likes to lose electrons. So you might have the case where you have iron two plus cation, right? So where am I gonna remove it? From the valence electrons. Notice I color coded it green, so I would remove it from the 4s. Now, you, you don't need to write out the 4s zero. In fact, I'm writing out the full electron configuration here to show you. You know, sometimes they ask you to use a shorthand version where, again, this 3p6, you're using the noble gas, which is before it, which would be argon. So you could actually write argon. That's a terrible bracket, sorry. You could write argon, and you don't even need to write the 4s zero, you can write the 3D6 for the iron two cation. But what we know is iron, there's not just an iron two plus, there's an iron three plus. So where do I go now if I've already removed, you know, the valence electrons? Well, I'm going to go to the sublevel because of the energy splitting to the higher sublevel, right? So you're not gonna pull an electron from 3s or 3p, you're gonna pull an electron from the 3d. And that's exactly what you do. And you get the configuration of 4s0, 3d5, which has this electron configuration, or orbital diagram rather. So we see that you know it's argon, because that's a noble gas in the core shells. It's a 4s0, you don't even really need uh, to write that in the electron configurations with orbital diagrams, I tend to ask students to do that. And then you're your 3D5. And look at that, iron 3 is happy because it has a half filled sublevel. And remember, based on what I said earlier, they like to be halfway filled. So, as a general review for the easier ones, when you have your electrons, you can just go straight to their location on the periodic table. We see that boron has five electrons, so you can count across the periodic table. I like to just look at the location of boron. Boron's in the period two, so the row two, it's in the P block and it's in that first position. So it's a 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, and these all add up to the five. I did this, uh, you see this with chlorine, there's 17 electrons, why it's in the third energy level. It's in the P block and chlorine's in a halogen, which is a group 7A or the fifth position of the P block. And then we wanna write out in the condensed version, you know, you would do neon because those are the core electrons in the first and second. It has a noble gas configuration of neon when you have your first and second energy level filled. And it's a group 7A because there's two plus five is seven valence electrons. But what I ask you to look at is really look at it, it's in the fifth position of that P sublevel. That's why it's a 3P5. The other two electrons are in an S sublevel. That's why it adds up to seven valence electrons. But again, when we remove electrons, we're removing them from the highest principal number first. So with that closeness between the 4S and the 3D or the 5S, and the 4D, we are removing it from the S's first. So nickel two, right? So I would actually first write out nickel's electron configuration, which would be 28. So nickel two would be 26. I have to remove two. Where am I going to remove it? From the 4S. And again, I you know, wouldn't even make you write that, but there you go. We did this for the iron. So it had 24. So it was a 4S0, 3D6. And we see it with zinc, and this is why zinc is so happy as a two plus, right? As a transition metal, it doesn't form multiple charges. It just forms two plus. Why? Look how happy it has. It has its third energy level, the entire energy level, principal quantum number three filled, S, P, and D, and it has that D sub level all the way filled. So it's really happy. And then, of course, keep in mind that group six and 11, because of that S and D being so close in energy due to energy sublevel splitting due to Coulomb's law and penetration and shielding, 
we see that we get these irregular patterns where the, the, the S sublevel is halfway filled so that it can make, so we see that the S sublevel is halfway filled so that it can make the D sublevel all the way filled, or even in some cases, it's halfway filled to completely fill that D sublevel, like we see in copper and silver. And again, where do we see that? Well, we saw that, um, I got a little bit of writing there, and let me erase that. Sorry about that, I get excited. Where do we see that? Again, we see it in that, you know, group six and group 11. Now you're gonna look at this and you're gonna see other irregularities. You're gonna, you're gonna see a bunch of irregular configurations like in the F block and stuff. They don't, they, they don't test you on those. I'm telling you, they don't test you. They don't expect you to figure those out like they do with the D block. So that's why this video focuses on that is if you're ever gonna take an American Chemical Society ACS exam for your college for final or in my class, when you look at your homework, they ask this. So I hope you enjoy this video and I hope it helps you understand some of the irregular configurations and the transition metal cations. Thanks for watching.